I welcome this opportunity to be with you, Sarah, uh, and uh, I asked uh, Mike Downey, you know, what, what would Sarah's, uh, what do you think they might need to hear? And he said, well, it's up to you, Bishop, but you might want to address in your talk in some way how Sarah's should respond to controversy in the church, how it affects our seminarians and young priests, and what we as Sarah's can and should do about it. So it's a delicate topic, but the Sarah's are very committed to their faith, be more traditional in some ways, but it's very much a concern. And I like to, to address that within uh, a certain context. Um, before I begin, though, I would like to uh, thank you for your fidelity to the mission of uh, prayer and support and encouragement and doing all you can as, as lay men and women uh, in fostering vocations, especially to the priesthood and to consecrated life. Um, <clears throat> I, um, we live in a time when commitment uh, is not valued, and if you look to scripture, and especially the relationship uh, between God and the Jewish people, the Israelites, what did he ask of them was fidelity to the covenant. And as we hear in the fourth Eucharistic prayer, paraphrasing that time and time again we broke your, the covenant, but through the prophets you taught us to for salvation. So fidelity is the great gift that we give back to God. And so you have been faithful to your mission from the very foundation, where, as you well know, Sarah, of all places, founded in the great Northwest, uh, not in Spokane, but in Seattle. Um, I like to place the situation we're in in a, in a bit of a context. Um, and I do so first. The longer I'm a bishop, the more I observe that a lot of the problems we have had in the church, let's say in the last oh, 60 or 70 years, um, has come from a lack of leadership. And I say that because when I look at schools, which is the area which I spent most of my priesthood prior to be a bishop, when I look at what happened to certain dioceses and religious congregations, um, it does seem to come down to, to leadership. The beauty of the church is we have over 2,000 years, as I tell the people of God and seminarians, there have never been the best time for the church. There never was. Now, there are better times for the church. And these are challenging times. Um, there have been better times for Catholic culture in the United States. But there have never been the best times because this life is passing. That said, we can always, should always strive for excellence and to strengthen our fidelity. But when it comes to leadership, I think really if it is flawed, it is really in three areas, or the reasons why. The first is an individual is scared. They don't want to take a stand. They don't want to hold the line. And we saw this in so many ways, and I, we do this in Catholic schools and institutions, on the whole issue of wokeism. The president of a private Catholic religious order sponsored school came to see me, and he wanted me to endorse essentially a woke curriculum on DEI. And I said, no. And he said, well, why is that? I said, because what you're offering is something that is found in the public school. In the church, racism, prejudice is a sin, really founded on two primary <coughs> pillars. We're created in God's image and likeness, and we're beloved sons and daughters of God. That's our foundation. We don't make any apologies for that. That allows us to pr pursue um, a path where everybody has dignity. Well, conception of natural death. If it looks like something that is found in a secular or government document, it's not of God. So we saw this in how many people, again, weakly afraid of being canceled, scared, what will others think? I had a couple of them that came to me and they thought that I wasn't doing enough uh, in that area. And I told them, they said, are you afraid? 
And I said, no. I know I said, but how about you? Are you afraid to join your bishop in the Spokane Walk for Life? It was quiet in this upper middle class couple. He's a lawyer. And I said, that means you might not be invited to the New Year's Eve cocktail party because you join your bishop in a walk for life in Spokane. So again, those who lead but are weak, I do have compassion for them because it's done out of fear. There's a second group that has led to the situation we're in, and that is those who want to compromise. Now, if you've heard me speak probably before, I often talk about my years growing up in, in Catholic San Francisco, and I sat on the board of charities because I was the chaplain of the St. Vincent School for Boys, which was an orphanage that was founded during the gold rush. But it had been subsumed by uh, charities and was part of Catholic youth organization first. And I said, when it comes to these issues, we need to always be compassionate. Compassion always compromise never. But too often there's a desire to compromise. To get along, we have to go along. And when it comes to getting government funding, you're going to play by a different set of rules. That's why I value so much the work of St. Vincent and Paul Society, because they do so humbly, quietly, caring for people without many times government funding. Those who want to compromise. Then there's this third group of why we're in a situation like this of controversy. And I don't want to scandalize you, but sometimes I wonder, do these individuals really believe? Do they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do they believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us? So anyways, the context in which we find ourselves in today that has led to this controversy is because we have scared leaders, leaders who want to compromise, and non-believers. How many here have ever read C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce? Now, I taught that in school, and I used to tell the students, this is not a book that you're going to be reading in the... Uh, your buddies on the car, the carpool driving from the upper part of the suburbs into the high school. You have to stay focused, as you well know, with the characters in The Great Divorce. But I would encourage you to read chapter five of The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis's book. And it's a discussion between a ghost who's called, now, I don't, it's a big book that's, I mean, it's a thin book, actually. It's a great book. And the, the greatest sin of all of these is pride. But in chapter 5, you have two, two spirits, a ghost, which are the ones who are closer to, I guess, purgatory and hell, and then the spirits are the ones who have gone to heaven. And there are two, they happen to be Anglican clerics. One is a bishop and one is a priest. The bishop is described as the fat ghost with the cultured voice. And I remember students asking me in class, what does that mean? Well, there's a certain cleric in the county who came from a very working class background, but happened to study in Europe, and he had one of those affective voices, like, hello. <laughs> and I thought, no, you were born in San Francisco. No one speaks with this fake British accent. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that, that ghost, the, the, the fat ghost with the culture voice, is talking to the spirit. He had gone on his path to heaven. Dick is his name. But this discussion really, I think, summarizes some of what we're going through in the, in the church and certainly in society. Dick, the one on his way to heaven, says to uh, the bishop with the, the cultured voice, our opinions were not honestly come by. We simply found ourselves in contact with a certain current of ideas and plunged into it because it seemed modern and successful. We were playing with loaded dice. Now sometimes I wonder if the issues, now take for example what is coming from the church in Germany. The German church that gave, the Germany that gave us the Reformation and two world wars, the German church basically, I wonder, is wanting to compromise fundamental church teaching because of that state tax. You know that, the, the tax that, the church in Germany is very wealthy. 
because it's a mandated tax. It has a huge, I'm told, bureaucracy of chancery offices with lay employees. But do people go to Mass? And if the reason to compromise church teaching is about money, that strikes me so not of God. Again, chapter 5 of the great divorce. The ghost says to the young priest, you became rather narrow-minded toward the end of your life, believing a little heaven and hell. And he said, you know, I question the doctrine of the resurrection because it ceased to commend itself to the critical faculties which God had given me. And then he proceeds to tell Dick, the one who's on heaven, uh, you know, I, we took risks. And he said, what risk? What came of it? Popularity, the sale of books, invitation, being a bishop? Um, I say all this because you place that into the context. Sometimes I wonder if the problems, the struggles we have in the church today are this desire to compromise with society, not to be canceled, and maybe being pushed forward by people who really don't believe. And so you as Sarans, and reflecting of, I think, the vast majority of the faithful and of priests and bishops and religious and lay faithful and deacons, you're trying to be faithful. You're trying to exercise fidelity, you're trying to live the gospel each day. I was, the reason why I was in Washington before here, I was speaking of the Carl Newman Society, which is the Catholic colleges that remain loyal to the church. I think we had Sister mentioned today about the enrollment of those colleges. And what, um, what was significant is, we were talking about the 30th anniversary of Ex Corte Ecclesia, which was a document of the Holy See about Catholic universities being the heart of the church. And it mentioned in this great book that was a reflection of, that was given in the conference I attended the year before in Rome, I was asked to, to speak along with the Dean of the Law School at Notre Dame on um, Catholic education and religious freedom. Now, I want to be very clear, I taught high school for 19 years. I was never on the university level. When I came to Spokane, I was dismissed by a certain a Jesuit at the University of Gonzaga who said, oh yeah, daily, yeah. He's a high school administrator. Uh, right was. I'm the first to, to say that. Um, but the bulk of our Catholic schools in this country are K through 12. And I think I understand it very well. I'm in my last youth of three year term as chair of the committee. But on a book that we received, there was the first chapter, there's seven chapters in the book. The first chapter is by a Holy Cross father from Australia originally. And uh, Will Miss Campbell is his name. And he wrote a great article about this Land of Lakes gathering in 1967 of the presidents of Catholic colleges. And he said, Hesper, who was the very successful long term president, used to often say that college is where the church does its thinking. And he said, Remember, the whole issue of this Land of Lakes was to separate itself from the life of the church, from hierarchy and really the body of the church to compete with the secular and private universities. And the Holy Cross Father in writing on this reflection said he never reconciled how the very entity that's supposed to do the thinking was to be independent of the body that it was supposed to be thinking for. And I think that summarizes it. Pope John Paul II wasn't amused when he heard that. And thus he pushed for this document. Father Miss Campbell, the priest who's currently, currently teaching at Notre Dame, said, looking back at that document, they were generally preparing for the wrong kind of conflict with the wrong foes. Little attention was to fashioning a curriculum appropriate for the times we were in, nor recruiting faculty committed to teaching. Part of the controversy that you now and all of us are dealing with is we have institutions of the church that have undermined the very church's mission. And as I said in the homily before, when you have the secular exercising its ministry with the mandate and the mission of God, and then Jesus, what you've done for the least, what you've done for me, that shapes why we teach in education, why we care in healthcare and in hospitals, and why in social services and charities we reach out to the poor. 
The why is more important than what we do. The why is it's a response to the gospel. But when you have the secular parallel with the, 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 the sacred and the secular, the secular, if it has money, if we don't watch out, will overcome the sacred. And I think that's part of the problem we are in today, uh, the controversy in the church. Now, you're all expecting me to say something about the document that came before Christmas on blessings. <laughs> and, uh, for my response to that, you have to go on the website of the Diocese of Spokane. <laughs> but that said, I think legitimately you've seen the response of various bishops' conferences. I, I read today, or yes, yesterday, that Holland, of all places, has taken a very strong stand on, on this. And I think, you know, again with the comments that Mike Downey had asked me to speak about is, um, how do we respond to controversy? These are controversial topics. And the way for us, I think, to respond is, well, you may have heard me use this before, is when it comes to the teaching of Jesus Christ, which has to be in season and out, we think of John 6, the teaching of the Eucharist, that we're told that people found hard and difficult, and they left. They returned, we're told, to their former way of life. So there has always been controversy in the church. There have been the best times? Never. Have there been better times? Yes. <coughs> but when you look at some of this controversy, what, how do we respond? Well, we look to the gospel, to Mark, and Jesus, and the rich young man. Especially Mark's version of it. Now, I think Cardinal Collins is a scripture man, and I am a high school man. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you I used to chaperone dances and try to capture kids from dancing too close to one another, screaming songs that are inappropriate. But, uh, but I do know that Mark's gospel, uh, three things define that moment of Jesus and the mission. We're told that he loved him, that is, he wanted what was best. And Christian love, as we know, whether it's what Aquinas has said, uh, or what we know, is to wish someone salvation, the salvation of souls. That's why the church exists, the mandate, the salvation of souls. Jesus looked, that is, he wanted what was best, which is the salvation of souls. The second is Jesus respected his freedom. Do you remember, Jesus doesn't force him to do anything, because the Lord always proposes, he doesn't propose. Very important. But the third, this is where we get into problems, and this is when we lead to controversy. Jesus did not compromise. Jesus did not say, well, sell half of what you have. <laughs> no, he remained firm. It was done out of love, he respected freedom, and he did not compromise. I think a lot of what we see in the church that has caused controversy is a desire to compromise. Now, the danger is, um, and this is probably the way the Lord works. Some of the guys that are, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in all, probably many of the dioceses represented here, you had priests that had very promising futures. They were very talented young men. And then you find out they leave. The father was so great. The father was so, maybe father had hitched his whole priesthood to externals. And we have to be very careful of that. Because what is in your heart when you give life or death to the soul? And I think the response of the externals was dangerous. Who are the priests that are being picked off and leading today? In many ways, they were the more traditional priests. And I say that because I was a vocation director for nine years, and I was a rector of a seminary. And I think that um, we have to be very careful that, and this is why we have propodeutic years, that year of preparation that has been added. We want a man to first be seeking to be a shepherd after the heart of Jesus Christ. And that is so important to do. And so we have, I think, that call always to be faithful. But how do we remain faithful? How do you, as sermons, how do you encourage priests and
fellow Sarans and seminarians and religious, at a time when it's difficult to commit, we heard that, when they look around and they think that, my God, what is this going to be? Fair enough. The old line, men and women, called the priest of a consecrated life, will give their life to a mystery, but they will not give it to a question mark. <coughs> and that's, I think, an accurate assessment. I think the way we deal with this, first we have to acknowledge the work of the devil. Now, Sister talked about the deeds, and my experience has been that the devil divides, distracts, discourages, deceives, and if not stop, will destroy. We see people getting discouraged and giving up. We see people being divided. We see people getting distracted. And if we don't watch out, we have destruction in our hands. Well, how then do we combat that? Well, I think we combat that with something you would predictably expect me to talk about, and that is humility. <laughs> um, I often, in, in the Diocese of Spokane, uh, which was settled in many ways by the Jesuit missionaries, and Gonzaga plays a crucial role, even though it's basketball, even before Bing Crosby, uh, that I often am quoting Vincent de Paul, but in many ways, this is a story of a conversion within his priesthood. He was a smart young man, but he wanted a better life for himself and for the family. And maybe his motives were not as devoted to the heart of Christ as it might be, but they did. And he did undergo this conversion. And one of the most successful things he, he helped do was implement uh, the directives of Trent on priestly formation. And he took the men that were already ordained priests and through what was called the Tuesday conferences, gave them instructions in theology and in prayer. But he wrote a lot about humility that is for the practical man or woman trying to live his faith. And he said the most powerful way to conquer the devil is humility. For as he does not know at all how to employ it, neither does he know how to defend himself from it. And of course, another very simple phrase that Mr. Paul said is humility is truth. Pride is a lie. So in many ways, the trouble we have in society is dishonesty. The trouble we have in the church at times is a desire to compromise with truth, which then becomes a lie. So we have to approach, and you and I should approach all of this in the spirit of prayer. The model of humility, of course, Jesus, which is the Word made flesh. The ultimate act of humility is God made man. And our Blessed Mother always leads us to her son, Jesus, and that spirit of humility. So we have to be committed to truth. We have to be zealous without being zealots. And we have to realize that there are no easy answers. But when we humbly seek the way of the Father, when we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, and then when I do confirmations, I really encourage our young people in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit that they really ask for wisdom. Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is intelligence and education with humility. When it lacks humility, it becomes arrogance. And arrogance is not of God. Arrogance is what got the church into trouble uh, when we did not do what was right on the abuse of crisis, the Herrick issue, and areas that really weren't uh, committed to Christ. As I say, there's not the best times in the church that have been better. And sometimes in talking to seminarians or younger priests, I speak of the time I was in a Carmelite, I think, seminary in the outskirts of Paris. This was maybe 25 years ago this summer. And there's a room called the Room of the Swords, and I often speak about that. The Room of the Swords is a room in a beautiful area in the seminary that overlooked a beautiful mannered lawn with that gravel that is unique to, to Europe and France. The revolutionaries took priests, rounded them up, and put them in this upper room on the top story. They had bars on the window, and the bars like a jail going into the room. At the end, overlooking that beautiful backyard, is where they would execute those who did not take the oath to the civil constitution. 
So the revolutionaries would come up and they would just randomly take two or three at a time, take them out, close the jail cell, all that were there would go to the window and look down. They would go up onto this little platform. He told them to take the oath or die. The vast majority chose to die. Their head would be chopped off, the head would fall down, the bodies would leave there. They would come back up at the end and they would rest the swords on the plastered wall. To this day, you can see the blood-soaked plaster with the swords encased with glass, the room of the swords. The students, the seminarians, the priests are looking at me and said, that's could be the alternative we have. But we're all still alive. We still are living in hopefully a free country. And um, that's what men and women endured for the faith. So we approach this with gratitude to Almighty God for our faith, what comes to us from baptism, the church that is Christ's gift, but we do so always with humility. So how then, to summarize it, do we deal with all of this? We live for truth, we speak the truth, we do so with humility. And I believe we will navigate ourselves through these troubled times, knowing those words of Jesus at the end of Matthew's Gospel. Know that I'm with you to the end of the age. We are never alone. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.